Okay, folks, let's get started. My week almost started off bad by forgetting to bring the camera, but Indira raced it over here for me, so you can thank her for the fact that you have a video today, so that's good. Okay, so um, I was very tickled last time. I, after the, the lecture, I heard from four different people who want to make the photosynthetic fish. It's, that's a record, and I hope somebody does it. So make, make, make the uh, photosynthetic fish. Uh, and if you're, if you're seriously interested in doing it, come see me. I'd be happy to give you some technical details and thoughts about it and uh, so forth. But um, the main thing is finding somebody who's willing to have you in the lab to do it. That'd be very cool if you, if you did it. So, All right, we're moving along now. Uh, talking about membranes, and I want to uh, go through a couple of things about membranes, and then we'll talk about transport systems. Uh, membranes are literally impermeable to almost anything except for those small molecules that I talked about before, water, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and oxygen. So other things that need to move across the membrane are um, um, uh, need, need transport systems. They don't go by themselves automatically. Okay, So we have to think about that, and that'll be part of what I'll be talking about later today. Before I talk about that, I need to just talk, uh, throw you out some terms. Megan, you had a question? Yeah, I was going to ask about water. It needs porin. Her question is, does water need porin to get across the membrane? The answer is it does not. So porin is a way, another way of getting water across the membrane, but it turns out that water is freely permeable across the membrane, and that has enormous uh, 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 implications um, that I'll be talking about later today. So we'll, we'll see about that. But, but no, it does not require porin to get across the, um, the membrane. All right, so um, what I'm going to show you is something called the fluid mosaic model. And I throw it out to you not because there's anything, I think, great or complicated about it, but it's something that you'll hear um, to describe biological membranes, and so you should be familiar with the, the terminology. The fluid mosaic model says basically that the membrane is not a solid thing. We'll see that there are temperatures at which the membrane can be a solid thing, but when we look at biological membranes, basically at the temperature in which organisms live, their membranes are largely fluid, meaning that there's motion. If we look at proteins, for example, that are embedded in those membranes, they move freely in that membrane. So there is a fluidity to it. It's not something like an ice structure that is rigid. It's actually very fluid. And so the fluid mosaic model is the name uh, that's given uh, to um, description of that. And I'm not going to go through any technical aspects of it. I think the idea itself is pretty straightforward. Now, relative to that is this figure right here. And this figure right here uh, is important because it illustrates properties that membranes have with respect to temperature. All right, with respect to temperature. TM is referred to um, sort of um, uh, off the cuff by people as the melting temperature. It's actually a transition temperature is what it is. But you, if you think about it as a melting temperature, that's OK. And if you call it a melting temperature, I'm not going to you know, count you wrong. Okay? TM is the midpoint of the transition on the curve where a membrane converts from being very solid-like, that is very crystalline-like, to very fluid-like, more liquid. Okay? And we can actually study these properties about these membranes quite readily. All right? So we see this transition. So the TM is the midpoint of that transition. Having membranes fluid is important for our cells. When our membranes solidify, the, the, the cell will largely die. We want our membranes to be fluid. So the consideration then is, well, what do we need to do to keep our membranes fluid? And there are two guiding principles for that. One is the amount of unsaturated fatty acids that are contained in the membrane. The more the unsaturated, the, the larger the number of unsaturated fatty acids, the lower the TM. Similarly, the more short the fatty acids, the lower the TM. So the shorter the fatty acids, the lower the TM. Now what we see in biologically is that cells largely use the unsaturation mode. 
Okay? How many people eat fish because of fish oil? Anybody? Okay. So fish oil's got some real cool, very polyunsaturated fatty acids. And the reason, one of the reasons that it has polyunsaturated fatty acids is because fish have to live in a cold environment. Compared to you or I, swimming out in the ocean is pretty darn cold. If you're swimming down deep in the ocean, it's even colder. Okay? A fish doesn't want its membranes to become solid. So a fish membrane has more polyunsaturated fatty acids in it to lower that melting temperature. That's why fish oil is full of polyunsaturated fatty acids and fat, polyunsaturated fatty acids that are good for you. On the other hand, if we look at something like that bacterium that I showed the other day living in that hot geyser, we would predict that it would have more saturated fatty acids and they would be longer. It would have a higher melting, a transition temperature for its um, conversion to solid to fluid-like. So that's an important consideration. Make sense? I can't get over this. This is the same class I had last term. You guys are, this is so quick. I don't know if I'm putting you to sleep this term or what. It's just everybody's so quiet. Yes, question back here. Does hypothermia have anything to do with these temperatures? In fact, no, um, it doesn't, surprisingly. It, it does not. Um, what hypothermia does is it's really ridding your body of heat, causing problems with that. And if you have severe cases of that, then you're going to have severe cases of freezing, and that kills cells uh, immensely. So no, no it, it does not. You can imagine your membranes may not like it a lot. So a uh, question over here. Yeah. Why does a shorter one lower the melting temperature? Because that's the chemical property of fatty acids in general. So if you look at fatty acids by themselves, shorter ones will have lower melting temperatures. More unsaturated ones will have lower melting temperatures. And that's the, that's the chemistry of, of those, of those um, molecules. Okay? It actually relates, if you recall last time where I showed you the figure where we had the very disordered membrane that was present when I had the unsaturated fatty acids compared to the very ordered membrane when I had the saturated fatty acids. Okay? Order equates with solid-like. The more disorder, the, the, the um, lower the temperature it takes to sort of mix everything up. So that's, that's basically, in, in a nutshell, why that happens. Kyle? Does frostbite on one of our mean that the temperature crossed the TM? Does frostbite mean that the temperature crossed the TM? As far as I know, Kyle, it does not. Frostbite usually means that you form crystals inside of your cells, and that probably will do you in before uh, your membranes have a problem. But I, I, I can't tell you definitively that your membranes won't also have a problem with that. But the main thing with frostbite is that you're freezing tissue, and freezing that tissue uh, causes crystals to form. And crystals inside of cells are just deadly because they poke holes in cells. They may rupture the, 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 the chromosomes and, and cause many other problems. Yes, sir? Is it, po oh, is it possible, you, is this like a bioterrorism thing you're trying to do here, or? <laughs> uh, I, is it possible? I will tell you that it's probably a, a much more challenging problem than you would think. Um, partly because you, uh, to do that, you would, you would largely have to replace the enzymes that are making the, the fatty acids that the cell already is making with a different group that would prefer a different thing. So I, I think it would be a very difficult challenge. So your career as a bioterrorist is, is gone. You, 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 you have to think of better ways to kill people, I guess. So, Okay, other, other questions? I woke you guys up with that. That's good. So that's, I'd like to see that, that response. Oh, yeah. There we go. Okay, I'm, I'm not ignoring you. Yeah, that's a good question. Do we, does, uh, the, basically, their question is, does the composition of the membranes of different cells of the body vary? And yes, they do. And so it's not surprising that you probably will find more unsaturated fatty acids on the uh, outside part of the body than on the inside part of the body. And there are other differences as well. Um, the chemistry of uh, membranes is not fully understood. We see, for example, differences in the positioning of positive and negative groups on different tissues, and those uh, differences aren't fully understood. 
Okay, good questions. So if you ask me more questions, I slow down. But then I have to be careful. I don't go too fast. All right. Um, there's just some various numbers. You can see the more unsaturated and the shorter, the lower the TM, okay? which is what I told you in words. Keep in mind these are fatty acids. Fatty acids are components of the glycerol phospholipids and the sphingolipids, okay? So they're not in there as free fatty acids. They're in there as components of those uh, larger molecules. And there's the ordered structure that we would see if we had saturated fatty acids. That's a saturated fat, actually. And there's the disorder that we see as a result of that bend that happens. So that disorder contributes to a lower melting temperature. And uh, we'll pass on that. Okay. The only other thing I want to mention here um, is uh, a phenomenon that we don't get to talk much about, and it actually pops up in a weird place here, but I'll mention it because it is relevant to membranes, and that is um, the, um, what's called receptor-mediated endocytosis. Now, we'll talk about this later, actually, but I want to expose it to you now because it is relevant to membranes. I said at the very beginning of class today that crossing the membrane is a very challenging thing because unless you're a, a small molecule such as I described, you need a transporter to get across the membrane. So if you're a protein or if you're a glucose or you are uh, some other sugar or an amino acid, you've got to have a transporter that you can link up with on the cell membrane that will move you across the membrane. Okay? Now, there is one exception to that rule, and that exception to the rule is shown here. These don't involve, this process that you see on the screen does not involve a specific transporter as such. What you see is the internalization inside of a cell of an LDL. An LDL is a low density lipoprotein. You don't need to write that down now. We'll talk about it later. But the process is the important thing here. The contents of LDLs, which include cholesterol and uh, fat soluble vitamins and related uh, lipid compounds, make it into the membrane not by going through a specific transport protein, but instead by being recognized by some proteins on the surface that bind to that LDL. They literally bind to that LDL. Okay? These pits, these are called clathrin pits, and clathrin is a protein that recognizes the LDL. It binds to it, and upon binding to it, it actually uh, sort of encompasses it and makes an internal granule like that, which is then opened up and the various uh, components are spread throughout the cell. This is the only exception to moving through a, tra a specific transport protein, and the process is called receptor-mediated endocytosis. So there's the receptor right there. These receptors have clathrin out there that are recognizing the LDL and bringing it into the cell. Okay, everybody else is going to come in by a protein. Okay. I should also mention while I'm here, you might wonder why, why cholesterol? What's, why does a cell want cholesterol? Cholesterol turns out to be also found in membranes. So in addition to the glycerol phospholipids and the sphingolipids, uh, we see cholesterol being bound there. And cholesterol has an interesting effect. You remember that graph I showed you earlier for the transition temperature? Cholesterol, when it's found in a membrane, does not change the, the uh, transition temperature. It widens the transition range. Okay? So that range spreads over a much longer period if this membrane has cholesterol than if it doesn't. And cholesterol is found in virtually every membrane. So cholesterol is an important compound for your body. That's why your body is making it, not to kill you, but it's making it because it's an important component. And cholesterol is such an important component that if you look in brain, for example, 14% of the dry weight of your brain is cholesterol. 14% of the dry weight of your brain is cholesterol. So cholesterol is a pretty important compound. And getting it into cells, which is, and this is the mechanism by which it gets into cells, is a very, very important mechanism. Okay, unless there are questions here, I will move forward to talk about membrane transport. This microphone is not doing hardly anything.
we go. Maybe it's now working. And throw these away. Okay, so let's turn our attention now to the actual tra uh, membrane transport process. And that is shown in the material here. Transport across membrane is uh, an important thing for cells. When we look at transport mechanisms, if we exclude the four that I talked about, water, car carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and oxygen, if we exclude those four, then we're talking, with the exception of endocytosis that I just mentioned here, we're talking about proteins moving things across. Those proteins can do it in a couple of ways. Okay? They can do it by what's called passive mechanisms. They can do it by what are called active mechanisms. All right? So a passive mechanism is a mechanism that does not use any energy except for that of diffusion. It doesn't use any other energy source. Diffusion is the driving force for the energy. And that means that passive transport mechanisms will only move things from areas of high concentration to lower concentration. From high concentration to lower concentration. These things are a piece of crap, aren't they? OK, so passive mechanisms. Uh, and there are numerous examples. I'll give you one uh, real quickly while I'm multitasking here. Uh, one example of a passive mechanism is a mechanism um, that's found in blood cells. Blood cells have in their membranes a protein. Well, I guess I'm out of luck. Um, <coughs> blood cells have a, a, a protein that um, allows glucose and only glucose to pass through it. And they don't use any energy to bring it in. And the reason for this is in the bloodstream, the concentration of glucose is generally higher than the concentration of glucose inside of the cell. So by diffusion, all you have is a, uh, a protein that says, first of all, it checks to see, are you glucose? Okay, And it's glucose. It lets it in. So it's kind of like having a guard at the gate. The guard at the gate lets the glucose in. And the glucose follows the concentration gradient. So if there's more outside than inside, glucose comes in. If there's more inside than outside, glucose goes out. OK? Make sense? Now, passive mechanisms will not, underline not, move something against a concentration gradient. They will not move something from low to high. OK? They will not move something from low to high. So that brings me to the definition of the other transport mechanism. And the other transport mechanism definition is that of active transport. Oh, by the way, I should also say that the first mechanism I described to you is also called facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion simply means there's a protein that's letting in a specific molecule, and it's letting it in by diffusion. That's all it means, facilitated diffusion. Active transport is the other mechanism. It's actually more common. And active transport is a mechanism where at least one molecule is being moved against a concentration gradient. At least one molecule is being moved against a concentration gradient. That means, therefore, that it takes energy. And that's actually the first slide I'm going to show you right here. Okay. Now, I could go to describe various things uh, to you. C2 is the um, concentration of um, the material inside the cell. C1 is the concentration of something outside the cell. As that ratio of C2 to C1 gets higher and higher, it takes more and more energy to get it in. Makes sense? The higher you make the hill, the, hard, the farther you've got to push the rock, right? So the higher the, the higher the concentration gradient you're working against, 
the more energy it takes to bring the molecule in. That just is, is sort of common sense. Okay. If we have a charge difference, let's say that we have, um, we're talking about a charged molecule. Glucose is not a charged molecule. Sodium is. So what if I'm trying to move sodium across the membrane, but there's already a ton of positive charge inside of the cell compared to outside the cell, I've got the same problem. So if I try to move something against a charge gradient, I've got the same problem as if I'm trying to move something against a concentration gradient. I'm going to have to put energy in to do it. And differences in charge will, in fact, affect how much energy it takes for me to move something across the membrane. This can work in my favor, as we shall see later talking about nerve cells. Okay? This can work in my favor because that energy that is there for the difference in charge is causing molecules to want to leave the cell. Okay? So I can use this as a force to actually push molecules out of cells, and we'll see this happens actually in nerve cells. Okay. All right. Now, um, I show you a structure here, not to get you to memorize anything, but it's the introduction to the first of the transporters I'm going to be talking about. So there's transport proteins are grouped into several different groups. We're going to talk about two of them. Okay? The first one are what are called P-type transporters. And these are groups of transporters that all have a common mechanism. This common mechanism involves ATP. And I should point out to you that not all active transport systems require ATP. Not all of them require ATP. There's other sources of energy besides ATP in the cell. All that it requires is an energy source for active transport. But what I'm going to be talking about mostly are things that use ATP. OK, so this molecule, phos phosphoryl aspartate, or phosphoaspartate, which is what I commonly call it, phosphoaspartate is an intermediate in the transport mechanism of P-type transporters. They're also called P-type ATPases. Okay? P is in Paul. All right? Now, we'll see how this comes into play in just a minute, but I just wanted to show it to you. You don't need to memorize the structure, but I just want you to be aware of what's there. That's the side chain of an aspartic acid inside of this protein. Here is a simple scheme for doing, um, it says energy input, but in fact they don't even show you any energy import, so your, your input, so your book is off to yet another great uh, thing. We'll assume there's some energy input here. In any event, what's happening is you see a transport protein here embedded in the membrane. It has a specific opening that will allow in only molecules of a certain shape, size, etc. So they're specific. This might be glucose, this might be sodium, this might be a variety of things, but it's specific for it. The, the molecule fits into the opening, and after it fits into the opening, a conformational change happens. That conformational change might happen without energy. It might require energy. If it happens without energy, of course, it's a, a passive system. If it requires energy, it's an active system. And now it opens to the other side, and the molecule leaks in. OK. So that's a general scheme by which these things work. The first of the P-type ATPases that I want to talk about are known as the calcium um, ATPases. And you've already seen the action of these guys. This is simply a schematic figure to show you that there's an important aspartic acid residue. You see it here, position 351. And I'm going to show you how that plays into uh, this uh, mechanism. Now, I said you've seen this, the action of this transporter before. If you recall last term, we talked a little bit about muscular contraction. And we talked about signaling involved in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Does everybody remember what I'm talking about? So I mentioned last term that if we look at the cell, calcium is a problem because high enough concentration of calcium causes your chromosomes to precipitate. So cells have to keep the concentration of calcium in the cytoplasm and nucleus relatively low so that we don't precipitate chromosomes. It does that by sequestering the calcium into specialized structures, 
In some cells, that's the endoplasmic reticulum. In muscle cells, it's called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And the way that that's done is using this transporter. This transporter grabs calcium from the cytoplasm and moves it into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay? So because this transporter does what it does, remember it's an active transport, so it's moving calcium from a lower concentration in the cytoplasm into a higher concentration in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Because this does what it does, our chromosomes don't precipitate. We've also got calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum that can be used for signaling, like you saw last term. Okay. And now what I'm going to do is just sort of step you through the mechanism. The mechanism is pretty straightforward. Here's the calcium ATPase embedded in the cellular membrane. You see we're looking here in the cytoplasm on the bottom and the sarcoplasmic reticulum lumen, that is the interior part of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, on the top. So we're looking at the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. We're looking at the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, what happens is, in the first step, two calcium ions bind into this binding site inside of the calcium ATPase. There's that aspartic acid 351 that you saw before. And there's its side chain. ATP comes along and binds into this little uh, nook inside of here. And once that happens, ATP transfers a phosphate to that aspartic acid residue. And you can see that's already happened here. The phosphate is on there, and we're left behind with ADP. Okay? That, upon release of the ADP, causes a conformational change. So the release of the ADP causes a conformational change that results in the calcium now being kicked, in this case, upwards into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay? So we've moved it from the cytoplasm to the, endopla to the endo uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum, from the cytoplasm to the, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, right here. Okay? So we've got it in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. We still have a phosphate on here. The cleaving of that phosphate now causes a set of processes to happen to where we go back to the original state where we can bind two more calciums. ATP um, hydrolysis is an essential part of this process because we are moving things against a concentration gradient. Okay. Make sense? Step by step by step. All right. The other class of transporters that I want to talk about are known as ABC transporters. And you might say, well, what, what's the difference between a P-type and, an and, and an ABC transporter? And these actually relate to different structural features of the proteins themselves. Okay? So we talked last term about domains. A domain is a structural feature of a protein. So something that's a P-type ATPase has a specific structure that we can recognize across many different types of membrane proteins. Okay? A very common structural feature. When we look at structure, we say, okay, that's a P-type. We look at a different structure, we say, here's an ABC type. Okay? And all these are different structures largely for binding ATP, different ways to bind ATP. That's really all they are. Okay? Now, this particular um, type of transporter is interesting, and it's clearly very important. I'll give you one example medically about where it is important. And it's important in cancer cells. It's important in some cases in bacterial resistance. It's much more of a problem for cancer cells. Okay? There's a protein that is a membrane transporter that's been identified as an ABC transporter called multi-drug resistance protein. And this protein will take things out of its cytoplasm and kick it out of the cell. So in some cases, multi-drug resistance protein has been implicated in things like cancer cells becoming immune to chemotherapy. Imagine, if you will, that you're treating cells 
with a drug that will kill them, if they start making multi-drug resistance protein, their likelihood of surviving is higher. They start kicking that out, they're going to become resistant to the thing that would otherwise kill them. This can operate in bacterial cells as well. If we look in bacterial cells, okay, we know the complete sequence of the bacterial genome and of the human genome. We know of 73 different ABC type transporters. Not, they're not all multi-drug resistant proteins. I don't want to give you that impression. But ABC transporters are very common, 73 of them in E. coli. There's over uh, about 200, I think, in human cells. Okay. So this mechanism is very common. The multi-drug resistance protein is one of them, and it's a very important one of them from a health perspective. Okay? It's thought that the multi-drug resistance protein is actually a protective mechanism for cells. What if, oh my God, I shouldn't have eaten that thing I just ate. Well, let's get it out of here. And then when they do that, they uh, are able to survive. Okay? So that's probably what multi-drug resistance protein does. Now, I'm going to show you the mechanism by which this uh, system works. You're not going to have to draw these if you're worried about that. I'm not going to make you draw the um, uh, mechanisms. Okay? Oh, I got, I'm back in the wrong one. The mechanism by which these work uh, is shown here. Actually, let me back up one slide, sorry. Actually, that wasn't what I wanted. I, I had it right. All right. So the mechanism by which these guys work is shown here. What we have down at the bottom are ATP binding domains. Okay? ATP binding domains. You'll see that there's two ATPs that are involved in this transfer. In this scheme, we have, in this case, moving things from the cell inside to the cell outside. And this just happens to be this particular transporter. Other things could be involved in moving things in from out. We're going to show you a mechanism out, from in, out to in. In this case, we're going to move from in uh, to out. Okay, so we've got the transporter sitting here. The transporter uh, opens up, and when it opens up, it can bind to a specific molecule. This can be a molecule, again, like a sugar or a drug or something like that. It uh, the binding of the um, molecule to the transporter causes a conformational change in the transporter. So you see it sort of clamping down its jaws like here. The clamping down the jaws also changes the binding sites here, which cause uh, ATP to be allowed to be bi uh, bound right there. ATP binds, and the binding of ATP alone is enough to change this guy to release this guy. And everybody says, well, why doesn't it just release ATP at this point? It can't. It's locked in this configuration. Okay. What it has to do to get out of this configuration is hydro hydrolyze the ATP, which it does next, and allows it to get, get back to its original state. Okay. So you'll notice the difference in this mechanism. We did not have a covalent intermediate. In the last one, we had that phospho uh, phosphoaspartate. In this mechanism, we don't have any covalent intermediate. Have we got that? Okay, what's orange and sounds like a parrot? A carrot, okay. You guys you guys don't know all my jokes, okay. <clears throat> I'm working, I'm trying to get some new stuff. I will get you some new stuff. Okay. Terms relative to movement of materials across the membrane. Okay. A, an antiporter is a transport protein that moves molecules in opposite directions. One, one direction, the other, the other direction. That's an antiport or an antiporter. You're the same thing. A symporter or a symport. And that's also, in some books, you see it spelled S-Y-N as in Nancy. I'll, I'll take that as an answer also. Either is fine. Sin or symport is something that moves two things in the same direction. Okay, Two things in the same direction. A uniporter is the, is the uh, more unusual of them. It moves the same thing in opposite directions. Okay. So we saw, we can see, for example, that the, um, the glucose transporter that I described to you, 
Okay? It could let things in, it could let things out. Okay? Depending on the concentration, that would be uh, an example of a uniporter. Okay. Um, I show you that uh, because there's an interesting um, other mechanism I want to show you here uh, first. Okay? This mechanism, uh, I'll let you decide if it is a symporter or an antiporter. Okay? Um, is driven by uh, an energy process that is not, underlying not, ATP. So that's one of the reasons I want to show it to you. There are other active transport systems that use something besides ATP as an energy source. Okay? And that's going to be a little confusing to you, so I'm going to be careful as I go through and describe it. How did I define an active transporter? What I said about an active transporter was active transport occurs when at least one molecule is moved against a concentration gradient. That's the key. Okay? At least one molecule is moved against a concentration gradient. This is an active transport system, and it uses an unusual energy source, although, as we'll see later, it's not that unusual. <laughs> this uh, transporter system is the lactose permease system, and it's the way bacterial cells get lactose into, their, uh, into them. Lactose permease, we'll actually talk about late in this term. Its mechanism of action isn't anything surprising. Here's a binding site. The binding site, uh, first of all, binds a protein. See with this carboxyl group? This proton comes in and it, uh, it, it makes that carboxyl a COOH. We've changed the charge of this guy. As a result of changing the charge, you can imagine we will change the shape of this protein a little bit. We change the shape. That now allows a lactose to bind. The lactose binding okay, causes a conformational change that now allows the lactose to be released inside and then the proton to be released inside. Now, this mechanism is moving lactose against a concentration gradient. There's more lactose in the cell than there is out of the cell, but the cell is still trying to bring more in. What is our energy source in this case then? Protons are the energy source. And how does this system work then? If you think about it, why should protons be doing this? Why do protons want to come into the cell? They're coming in because there's more protons outside the cell than there is inside the cell. Now this is confusing because the protons are essentially diffusing. However, what they're doing is carrying with them lactose. Okay? So in this case, we actually see some diffusion that's happening, but it's carrying something with it that is going against the concentration gradient. That's why I gave you that very careful definition to start with. It's active transport if at least one molecule is being moved against the concentration gradient. So in this case, diffusion is actually helping the cell to bring in something that doesn't want to come in. Now we'll see in the lectures on electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation that movement of proton protons across a, a membrane like that is a great energy source for cells. Yes, sir? Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> Ignore that lactose. The book is off to a really, really doing great, isn't it? It's a pretty good book. I like the book, actually. Uh, we're in the process, they're in the process of doing a new revision um, uh, to the textbook, and I, I hate revisions as much as you do because they want you to buy new textbooks, right? And so I'm very careful of what I'm willing to take with that. So I, I was actually involved in reviewing the new edition of this textbook. And it looks promising. It actually looks like they've got some very cool things in it. You guys won't have to worry about a new edition. But um, uh, hopefully that we won't, we'll be able to use as much as we can of the older edition as well. OK. So this guy is using a proton gradient as an energy source. Here's uh, a figure that's not in your book. Yes, sir? Very good question. Ryan asked if the concentration, um, uh, the, the benefit that's realized by the concentration difference of protons greater than that of the, the lactose, is that, is that what enables it to bring it in? And the answer is basically yes. 
basically, yes, you have to have a, a high enough concentration of protons to make that driving force sufficient to bring that thing in. So yes, yes, that's true. Okay, and this is one of the reasons when we look at bacterial cells, remember I talked about bacterial rhodopsin? What was bacterial rhodopsin doing? It was kicking protons outside the cell. It was making that concentration be higher outside the cell so that now you've got a driving force to bring things in that the cell wants. That was kind of cool. Your fish can do that. Did I see another hand? Okay. All right. This is a figure that's not in your book. And it's really stupid that it's not in your book. Because this transporter over here on the left is one of the most important transporters in all cells. It's called the sodium potassium ATPase. It is also a P-type ATPase. So this guy's going to have a phosphotyrosine in its mechanism. OK? Now, first of all, notice that it's an antiporter. It is kicking three sodiums out and two potassiums in. OK? I'm not going to go through the mechanism. They're all very similar. Step by step by step, you ultimately end up with three sodiums out, two potassiums in. You might wonder, why in the world do cells do this? Why do cells want to kick out sodium and bring in potassium? Okay? Every cell in your body is doing this. And every cell in your body is doing this furiously. A major need for ATP in your cells is doing this thing right here. Why? Okay? Well, one of the reasons why is this is an energy source for bringing in glucose. Just like we saw the protons bringing in um, lactose in bacterial cells, a sodium gradient can bring in glucose by a mechanism like what we saw before. But that's not the main reason that cells are doing this like crazy. Okay? The main reason is this. Remember I said that water is permeable across the membrane. If you think about what's inside that membrane, you've got salts in there, you've got proteins in there, you've got all kinds of things that are not present in that extracellular fluid. Water is going to try to diffuse in and equalize that concentration. It's going to try to diffuse in and equalize that concentration if you don't do anything. If somehow you start mucking with the ionic balance of the cell, you prevent water from diffusing in. And that's exactly what's going on. This guy is changing the ionic balance of the cell drastically by, change, by putting sodiums out and potassiums in. And in doing so, it stops water from diffusing across the membrane. <coughs> in other words, it's sort of using a trick to balance the cell osmotically. If this guy dies, the cell explodes. The cell will explode. It will engorge with water, and it will rupture. Okay, That's not a good career move. We don't want our cells to rupture. So the sodium potassium ATPase plays a very, very important role in balancing that. And as we're going to see, this guy plays a critical role also for nerve cells. This is essential for neural transmission. Okay? So um, we, we shall see about that. Questions on this before I move for, past the Yeah, Megan? Does it have a major uh, regulatory effect when you drink things like electrolytes? Um, the answer is, uh, I would say no, as far as, as, far as I know. Um, with electrolytes, largely what you're doing is you're replacing ions that have been lost as a result of sweating and, and, and things like that. So um, if you uh, were to, uh, say, be doing that without that loss, that sweating, and all that other stuff, over time that will cause a problem. And the problem that it will cause, many of you probably know, is high blood pressure. So when you get high blood pressure, what they will do is they'll put you on a diet to reduce your sodium and increase your potassium because, again, that is having uh, effects um, at, at more of a system level than it is individual cell level. But that's, that's one of the things that will happen uh, with that over time. Yes? So when the cell has uh, action potential, how does the water affect it? Does it 
rebalance it quick enough before the, enough water can rush in and damage anything? Okay, so his question is when cells have an action potential, does water um, cause a problem with that? Um, the answer is, is there's not enough of a difference that's created that water rushes in and causes a problem, although that is a consideration in how this um, can happen. Okay, but let me talk about that when I talk about nerve cell uh, transmission a little bit. Okay, let's see here. What do we have next? All right, digitoxygen. This guy right here, you guys have heard about digitoxin, all right? Digitoxin is a heart stimulant. I'm going to finish the day talking about this, okay? Digitoxygenin is a poison. So people use the term digitoxin, digitoxygen, and sort of interchangeably. They're poisons. Get it from a, a plant called foxglove. Okay? So don't go out eating foxglove leaves. You'll poison yourself. All right? Now, it's a poison, but it is used to stimulate people's heartbeats. Okay? So digitoxin is used to stimulate heartbeats. How does it do that? Okay? What digitoxygenin or digitoxin does is it binds to the sodium potassium ATPase. Not surprisingly, that's going to cause some problems. Right? Not surprisingly, that's going to cause some problems. When that happens, the sodium potassium ATPase cannot understand, cannot be um, pumping out sodium. Okay? What's going to happen in, if you're a heart cell, you have a heart tissue? What's going to happen when this binds to the sodium potassium ATPase? Well, the extracellular concentration of sodium is going to go down. Right? Everybody agree with that? Because normally it's pumping sodium out. We shut it off. It's not going to be, there's not going to be sodium out there. So we're going to have sodium concentration outside the cells down. Calcium. Calcium is used for muscular contraction. Correct? Okay. Now, Calcium is a problem because once a muscle contracts, we have to get that calcium out of there so this, the concentration gets low before it can contract again. Right? Everybody with me? All right. I've shown you one way that we reduce this, the, the um, concentration of calcium. That's by putting it in the sarcoplasmic reticulum with the ATPase, right? The other way is that there is a, a, um, um, a, a transport system that will use a sodium gradient to pump calcium out. Sodium gradient to pump calcium out. So both of those combine, okay, that is the calcium uh, pump in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and this sodium calcium antiport combine to lower cytoplasmic concentration of calcium, right? Now, I've just told you that you give digitoxin, what's happening is the concentration of sodium outside is low. What's going to happen to this calcium sodium pump? It's not going to work, right? What's going to happen to cal calcium concentration inside of this heart cell? It's going to be high. And calcium is going to make that heart cell contract stronger. Okay? So digitoxin is given to people who, ha who are having difficulties with, say, congestive heart failure or something like that to make their heart beat more strongly. And it does it by the mechanism I've just described to you. Now, I know that's a mouthful, but I'm going to just run through it real briefly before we run out of time, okay? Digitoxin lowers extracellular sodium. Extracellular sodium is involved in pumping calcium out of the cell. When extracellular sodium concentration goes down, Intracellular calcium concentration goes up. And since intracellular calcium concentration is linked to muscular contraction of the heart cell, the heart beats more strongly and, um, as a consequence, does a better job. All right, that's where I'll stop for there today, and I will see you guys on next time.
Hey, Hong, how you doing? Hey, guy, how's it going? You ready to make that fish? Yeah, yeah. All right. Do it. It's in the main office. Yeah. Hi. How you doing? Good. What's going on? Well, um, 